life is hard. Uh, I said the other day at a uh, talk that I was giving and uh, business is harder, but it's a very interesting journey as far as I'm concerned. And it's one that regardless of all of the trials and tribulations, the successes and the failures and the heartbreak often uh, that uh, I wouldn't change anything from that. And, and in the sort of time that I've been doing this, there's lots of lessons that I've learned uh, from all of this. It's things that has changed my life. It's things that has changed our business. It's things that just change a lot of things. Uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing just some of those with you today. And uh, with that, let's get the show started. Looking forward to a jam-packed show. Good morning, good morning. I hope you are doing fantastically well uh, on this Friday. It's quite an interesting day. Uh, wind is blowing. It's cool. Uh, all of that good stuff. So uh, I don't know where you are, what the weather is like, but uh, yeah, it's a little bit different, uh, but good stuff. It means that autumn is here. It's coming, um, I think. Uh, I hear it's raining in certain places. So yeah, very interesting. Anyway, warm welcome to another fantastic show this morning. Uh, today, sharing some of the multiple, multiple, like, I don't know, gazillions of lessons that I've learned uh, and uh, today is not about me. It's not about, uh, you know, sort of my journey and my things, but there's certain things that I've picked up on that makes a bigger difference than others. And I think sometimes we sweat the small stuff instead of focusing on the things that really matter. And I want to share some of those with you, and I'll tell you a little bit more of where all of this comes from and where it fits into stuff. But uh, seven things that I want to share with you today uh, that I felt uh, just, you know, maybe it's time to talk about those things. So really looking forward to that. So thank you very much for joining us. If you're here live, fantastic. Uh, invite your friends and your colleagues. Uh, let them know. Get the link. Uh, send it to them and say, come on, we're waiting for you. Uh, and on that note, uh, thank you very much for being here. If you like this episode, give it a like. Uh, share it with others. Uh, we really appreciate you helping us uh, get the word out. Anyway, so who's here as well? Uh, of course, Lelani is here today uh, with all the latest news. And I'm looking forward to hear what has happened in this last week. Short weeks. We've had some short weeks. And uh, yeah, to stay up to date is uh, very important. And then we've got Kim Potkita is back with Wellbeing on Money. And she's talking today about your relationship with money. And then Quibus is here as well with the Advisors Path. Uh, talking about some advisor life lessons. So really looking forward to that. Got a couple of quick announcements. And then I'm going to share uh, today's topic with you. So with that, uh, let me say a warm good morning to those of you who are saying hi in the chat. And thank you for always doing that. I really appreciate it. Mr. Mark Weston Ford, you must be very happy. There's only an hour difference now. So uh, it means it's other than our additional sleep, maybe. I don't know. Shame. You had to get up very early to, to make it, and you always do. So thank you so much. Uh, we've got David Kopier. Good morning, David. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got Terence in the house. Uh, good morning. Happy, happy. I think Terence is having the best Friday of all of you. Um, he is so happy. Uh, so, yeah. So, Stephen, good morning. Nice to see you as well. Uh, Johan Basson, good morning. Nice to see you. Frank, good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. Joseph, good morning. Hope you're doing very well. Um, looking forward to this episode and the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Harry Nell, nice to see you. And Nantes, nice to see you as well. Lekker. Um, it's been a while. So we've got Haloise. Good morning, Haloise. Uh, Lihana is here as always. Good morning, Lihana. Salome, good morning. Goedemorgen. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for saying hi. Uh, we've got Willem, Bas, uh, Willem Bester. Almost, you always turn into Willem Basson and we found you at the tree, you know, so, but that's a different different Willem. Hello, Willem. Nice to see you. Thanks for saying hi. Uh, Francis, Nietlin, good morning, Francis. I can only talk on you. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a catch. Uh, Razan, good morning. Welcome. Uh, nice to see you back. Uh, hope you had a good long weekend. Arun, good morning. Uh, nice from Paul uh, around the corner now. Uh, so good morning, Mary Remke. Mary, welcome. Uh, Kevin, there you go. Laka, Kevin, nice to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Gary Wilson, good morning. Tanya, good morning. Goeiemorgen. And uh, Mr. Neil Phillips rounding it off this morning. Righty, ladies and gents, with that, let's get into the show. And first up, we have Lalani with Current Affairs, uh, which is all the latest news from the financial planning profession. <music> Thank you. 
Yes, good morning, Francois and team. It is indeed a rainy day here in Pretoria. Before I kick off into the news, Francois, maybe something quickly. Um, that book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, the one thing that I remember from that book is always look for the moment of innocence. People inherently are good. We're not inherently bad. So when somebody is overreacting or they're passionate about something, there's always a moment of innocence, and we need to appreciate that. All right, let's jump into the news, Francois and team. So what is new from the Financial Sector Conduct Authority? So this week you would have seen that they've published a communication around financial statements and other statutory returns that we need to submit as financial planning services providers. So in the old days, before the 1st of April 2024, and that's no joke, it just happened to be on the 1st of April, you could submit your statutory returns and financial returns by hand, by courier, or you could upload it onto the Phase E portal. From the 1st of April onwards, you can only submit your financial statements and statutory returns via the e portal. Why? Well, then they make sure that nothing goes lost via the courier or via snail mail, um, and it's faster. They pick up your annual returns much faster. So please do remember that is effective already and in working from the 1st of April. Submit all your financial statements and statutory returns via Phase E portal. Then the unclaimed assets, you would have known that I spoke about this quite often at the annual refresher um, or, you know, on propulsion. We spoke about it when it first came out in 2022. Can you believe we're in 2024 April already? So that is the document that the Financial Sector Conduct Authority sent out in about November 2022, if I recall correctly, where they asked the financial services industry at large for comments on how National Treasury and themselves should deal with unclaimed benefits. So yesterday, um, we saw communication coming out from the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. Um, in fact, it was not yesterday, it was last week already, um, where they responded to the comments received into the framework needed for unclaimed assets in South Africa. Now, that document is not that hectic to read. It's just a few pages, and it's really interesting reading. Um, I would really encourage you to read that document. It's on the FECA's website, and the FBI also posted it on the FBI community. Um, just have a look at the latest conversations on the community. So the long of the short of the document is that it is confirmed that there must be a framework we, um, you know, the industry, National Treasury and FECA can work within the framework, first and foremost, to identify what is unclaimed assets, to um, also define what is unclaimed assets across the industry, but also the framework, how to manage that and who should manage it. It has been confirmed that there must definitely a, be a central unclaimed assets fund. So read that full document. It is available on their website. Then an update on the banks go matter. You'll recall a few weeks ago, Francia and team and listeners, when I gave an update on the banks go matter. That is the issue where we have the deep fake matter where um, it's Elon Musk and people like Nikki Oppenheimer and Jan Rupert that says, invest on this platform, you'll double your returns and whatnot, everything else. So um, there's an update from MoneyWeb, and I do want to congratulate and compliment MoneyWeb in the way that they've handled this matter. So you would have seen maybe an article from MoneyWeb. Um, MoneyWeb website has been targeted by cyber attacks and extortion demands due to the reporting on potential ties between Banksco and fake investment schemes using identities of business icons like Johan Rupert and Elon Musk, as I've mentioned. The attack specifically, um, um, the attack specifically targeted two articles published by MoneyWeb about Banksco's onboarding individuals who registered on the fake ads promoting high monthly returns on small investments. Now, MoneyWeb's IT term, team and service provider have blocked the attacks, um, but the attackers have now threatened to continue until these articles are removed from MoneyWeb. Now, banks go denies any involvement in the attacks and state that they have approached the press council for relief on the matter. So the attacks were distributed denial of service. So it's called DDOS. So the attacks were distributed denial of service attacks, overwhelming money web systems and requests, particularly targeting the two banks go articles. Now money web received an email proposing a deal to stop the attacks if the articles are removed. But MoneyWeb stands by its reporting and will not delete the articles. MoneyWeb also received a threatening email from the same address, threatening the closure of their domain if the articles is not removed within 72 hours. 
Now, again, MoneyWeb stands by its reportage and reporting on Banksco and advised investors who have been affected to contact MoneyWeb. Then, Francois, on to the uh, FPI and why we've got a few happy pe people online this morning. Congratulations to the candidates who passed the professional competency examination. The results were indeed released earlier this week, and I'm happy to report back to the community at large that the pass rate is sitting at 54%. So well done to those who were found competent. You are welcome to contact the FBI if we have not contacted you yet to become a certified financial planner of the Financial Planning Institute and to join the global community of CFP professionals. Global community, we're standing on a whopping 214,000 CFP professionals globally. Then, Francia, I'm going to close with a quote from today. Um, I've got this... Um, folder, uh, my diary, where, where I note what I need to do for the day. And I thought I'll share today's message for you because we, we've got a quarterly exco session today at the FBI that's going to run the whole day. Now, I'll start off with saying everybody has got a lot on their plate. Now, according to John Maxwell, the secret is not to want more or to want it faster. It is to put more time and attention into what you have and what you can do now. On that note, blessings. Have a fantastic weekend, everybody. Goodbye. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much, Lelani. And big congratulations to all the people who passed their PCE. It is not a small feat and massive congratulations. I remember when that pass rate was a lot lower. So there's massive strides being made that made sure. I think the one thing that's important for me from that point is that people are practice ready when they do these things and when they pass, uh, because those PCEs are really, really focused on the practical side of what it is that we do. So big congratulations to everybody who passed and to the FBI for a fantastic job. Alrighty, so next up, we've got Kim Potriter, and uh, Kim is talking about your relationship with money in a segment called Wellbeing and Money. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I'm in a rainy Johannesburg, and I've just returned from an incredible trip um, to Mexico. I went to further my learnings. As you all know, I'm a serial learner, and my friends call me the course queen. But the good part about my learning, I hope, is that when I go and I do these courses, my favorite part is to come back and share what I learned. So I was in Mexico with Chip Conley on, at his Modern Elder Academy, learning more about midlife. So Francois has promised me that uh, I can do an interview with him around the learnings that I've had and then share it all with you so that you can use that work either for your personal life and your personal well-being, but also for that of, of your clients. And um, I, I do think uh, it's a good one to tune in for. Uh, we're going to be talking about midlife. And when you talk about it, it's from 35 to 55. I mean, 35, there, there I go, 35 to 75, which for me completely changed my outlook on what midlife is. So 35 to 75. So it, it actually encompasses a whole lot of us. But today is not about midlife. Today, I wanted to talk about something Corbus brought up on his slot last time, and that is our relationship with money. So we all have this incredible voice that goes in our head all the time, telling us all the stuff. And there is a part of it that we are having discussions around what we think about money in our lives. And it brings me to where I wanted to start by saying to you, if you were sitting with a therapist, you and your money, and you were talking about your relationship with money, what would you be saying? Would you be saying that money is your friend? Would you be saying that money causes you a lot of stress? Um, and just to, to, to ponder on that, like what would your conversation be with a therapist about your relationship with money? A lot of times when I bring this up, I, I do, I, I see people's faces, like seriously, a relationship with money. And yes, we do have a relationship with money. It's, it's one of our longest relationships that we have. 
um, you know, when we're born, we, we're observing and we're seeing other people, how they do things right up until we're dying and we're planning how to leave our money to look after our loved ones. So it's this long relationship that's absolutely filled with emotions and lots of emotions that go with the money. If only money was just the form of exchange. So where do we start with our relationship with money? Interesting fact. Um, our relationship with money is normally formed by the age of seven. By the age of seven, we don't even want to talk to our children about money when they're younger, because if we talk to them about money, it might be too soon. But yes, it's by the age of seven. So if you could think back to your own life and your own kind of memory that you have around money. Now, sometimes people say to me, does it have to exactly be before seven? I remember something that happened to me when I was 14. Obviously, I, what, I, what I'm saying is, where did it have an impact on you? What were those lessons you were learning? Were you learning that money was your friend or were you learning that money was something hard and difficult and scarce? So thinking back to those memories and actually writing them down, jotting them down and saying, this is some of the memories. There might be three, there might be four, putting them down and then going, okay, now that I've got these memories, I need to now have a look how they are impacting my life. Because what happens is we have these memories that go straight away into our unconscious mind. It's sitting in our unconscious. We're not even thinking about it. But when we get into a certain um, situation, it kind of clicks, it triggers for us, and then we act in a certain way. I was with a client uh, the last few weeks, and for her, and the way she saw money, was always that it was how you loved and how you cared for people. Now she's in a relationship and she's trying to show her partner that she loves them. So every time they get into debt, she's bailing them out of the debt. She's paying their debt and getting them out of the debt. But what this is doing is it's absolutely sabotaging her financial plan. She is not going to have enough for her retirement if she carries on doing this while her partner doesn't have to be concerned about the debt they're going into. So what, what, what do you do about it? Um, intrinsically, I don't think we change our memory, but I think the important part is we just become aware of it. So we, we bring it to the surface. We have that real conversation and we go, is it showing that I love somebody because I'm, de I'm bailing them out of debt? Would it not be better that I use tough love and really help them to get the right habits for themselves? Other people might use have had relationships with money where, 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 where they were they felt power was used over them with it. And now when they feel somebody else is trying to control them with power, they then react in a wrong way and they sabotage their plan by not making wise decisions. So what I encourage you to do before you work on this with your clients is to do it with yourself, to actually jot down some of your memories around money, see where they are serving you. If they're serving you, keep them. If they're not serving you, then to look into how do we now change that? And the quickest way for me that I, I work and do it is I say, is this reality or is this a belief? If it is my reality, that is different. But if it is a belief, then I start looking at the habits that I put in place and I start looking at which ones I can change. We can't change it overnight. It just it does take disciplined um, behavior. And it also just takes you becoming coming clean with yourself and going, okay, I now want to have money in my life where it's my friend and I'm going to look at it. And for all of us in a relationship, remember your partner's coming with their own relationship with money. Have those conversations um, with your partner, not when you're fighting about money, but just have it as a good conversation of, of, over a meal or, or sometime when you're thinking about it. And remember, also, your children are watching you. All of our behaviors, our children are watching us. So when we say it's hard with money, money's scarce, they're watching all of this happen, and that is shaping their relationship with money. So what I leave you with is let's just consciously talk about money so that we can make sure that we have money in its right place and money can be our friend because, after all, it's got to enable our lives, and it is important but it's not important when we are consumed with negative thoughts about it. So thank you very much, Francois and team. And uh, I'll look forward to sharing with you next time. Have a wonderful weekend.
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kim. That was a fantastic segment. And uh, really looking forward to next time session. So with that, we've got Quibus and uh, Quibus talk about some advisor life lessons today in his segment, The Advisor's Path. Good morning, Francho. It's a privilege to be live again among my peers who share the passion, the challenges, and the triumphs of our profession. This morning, I want to share with you some life lessons that have not only shaped my career, but have also deeply influenced how I serve my clients. First and foremost, I embrace lifelong learning. Our profession is in constant flux with regulations, products, and markets always changing. Early in my career, I realized the importance of staying ahead of the curve. It was never just about fulfilling CBD hours, but truly understanding the world our clients navigate daily. Podcasts during my morning run, audiobooks on my commute, and webinars, seminars, and conferences with the FBI or similar have been invaluable. The more we know, the better we serve. Empathy is our most powerful tool. Remember, behind every portfolio or financial plan is a person, a family, a set of dreams, and sometimes a collection of fears. Early on, I learned that listening is far more important than speaking. By truly understanding our clients' perspectives, we can tailor our advice to fit their unique life stories. The empathy builds trust, and in our business, Trust is everything. Adaptability is key. If there's one thing certain in our profession, it is uncertainty. Market downturns, regulatory changes, global crisis, you name it, we have it. We have learned to view these challenges as opportunities to reassess, adapt, and innovate my strategies. This flexibility has not only helped me navigate tough times, but has allowed me to identify unique opportunities for my clients. Networking is not just a business activity, it's a growth strategy. The relationship we build with our peers, mentors, and even competitors are invaluable. Early in my career, I was hesitant to reach out, fearing I had little to offer. But I quickly realized that this community is one of shared challenges and mutual support. The advice, the different perspectives, and the shared experiences have enriched my practice in ways I could never have imagined. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, balance is not just important, it is crucial. Our profession, as rewarding as it is, can also be all-consuming. There is a relentless pressure that comes with our work. The need to always be available for our clients, the constant vigilance required to monitor the market, and the ongoing need to connect with new clients. These demands are unending and if not managed carefully, can lead to a profound sense of burnout. I've learned sometimes the hard way that achieving balance is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Early in my career, I found myself constantly on edge, checking emails at all hours, and feeling guilty for any moment, not directly spent on advancing my career or my clients. It was a relentless cycle that began to detract from my effectiveness, and more critical, my overall happiness. Acknowledging this was the first step towards seeking a healthier work-life balance. I started by setting boundaries for myself, such as designated work hours and specific times when I would not check emails or take work calls unless in an emergency. I also made a conscious effort to dedicate time to my personal life, be it spending quality time with my family, engaging in hobbies that I love, or simply taking time to rest and recharge. These might seem like simple changes but they required the deliberate effort to prioritize and protect my time outside of work. The impact of these changes was profound. Not only did I become happier, but the quality of my work improved significantly. I found that by allowing myself time to disconnect, I returned to my work with a clearer mind and a renewed sense of purpose. This not only made me more effective in my role, but also more present and attentive in my interactions with my clients. Investing in my personal well-being helped to mitigate the creeping sense of burnout. 
It reminded me that while my career is an important part of my identity, it's not the entirety of it. Balance is not something that can be achieved overnight, nor is it static state. It requires continuous effort and adjustment as our personal and professional lives evolve. But the rewards, increased happiness, and professional effectiveness are well worth the effort. In closing, I would like to say that each of us has a unique journey in this profession. The lessons we learn along the way are not just about becoming better advisors, but about becoming better listeners, thinkers, and ultimately better people. As we continue to navigate the complexities of our profession, let us keep sharing these lessons, supporting each other, and striving to make a meaningful impact in the lives of those we serve. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to learning from our community. Over to you, Francois. Thank you so much, Kubas. A fantastic segment. And with that, let's uh, do some quick announcements. All right, so there's loads of stuff happening. April uh, turns out to be an extremely busy month. And uh, so I just want to quickly share just a couple of things. Next week, can you believe it? It's here. Uh, the Propulsion Tech event is taking place. You've heard me talk about this for the last three months and uh, really looking forward to this. Uh, if you still haven't got your ticket, uh, well, you've got a couple of days left. So please go and get your tickets. Uh, there is uh, a lot going on at this particular uh, event. So it's not only the demos and seeing 18 different uh, tech providers show you live what their systems can do in only a mere 20 minutes. Uh, so it's really like this showcase where you can go and see everything and then sort of decide who you want to talk to more and uh, get in touch with them and meet them and know who to talk to. And you can even at the event talk to them about your particular situation if you want to, or you can set up time with them afterwards. So that's all up to you. Uh, but the purpose of this event is to showcase all the tech that's available that can make your life so much easier. But also, uh, you know, that's not enough. Uh, being shown 18 different systems is fantastic. And if you want to implement all 18, fantastic but at the end of the day, that's not really what makes it worth your while. So uh, you do want to know what to look for, how to identify the right tech, all of that. So there's loads of keynotes and panel discussions and some practical fun things that we're going to do uh, to help you with exactly that. And in the process, you'll also be earning uh, up to 14 verifiable CBD points, which is fantastic. And if you even can't make it on these three mornings, uh, which is the 9th, 11th, and 16th of April, you will also be able to uh, watch the recordings until the end of April. So on the same event platform, recordings will be available. And if you watch the recordings, you will still earn your CPD. So uh, that's all fantastic. So you can head on over to propulsion.co.za forward slash tech. Uh, the link is also down in the description below. And you will be able to go and see the whole agenda. We've got some fantastic people speaking uh, at this. And they're all fantastic. Uh, we usually only get fantastic people. So we're really excited for that. So come and join us. It's live. It's virtual. And uh, the 9th, 11th, and 16th of April in the mornings. And uh, then the virtual exhibitions are open for you to go and visit at any time. Uh, if you want to connect with any of those providers or have conversations with them, uh, et cetera. Righty, so that's the one thing. Then the other thing that's finally coming to life uh, next week on the 10th of April, we are launching the Financial Advisors Playbook. Um, I'm not going to tell the whole story today, but uh, yeah, there is. You can go check out my LinkedIn profile. Uh, we did uh, sort of promote it there. I'll also be sending out an email today, just inviting everybody to this. It's open for anybody in the profession to come and attend. Uh, it's virtual. We're launching it virtually. I think it's at 11 o'clock on the 10th of April. And uh, you can join us for that. Uh, 13 authors came together to, to write each a chap a chapter in this book. Uh, and it's really uh, a fantastic book. Uh, I can't believe how it's come out. So we are going to launch that. Uh, if you want to join us for that, uh, look out for the communications. All right. So that's that. And then a session in propulsion that I'm very excited about uh, that we're having on the 25th of April is Words That Work, um, Financial Advisor's Guide to Masterful Prompt Engineering. The big thing with artificial intelligence is that, yes, it's fantastic. Yes, it's the only thing you see on LinkedIn these days or on YouTube or anywhere you go. It's just everybody talking about AI. But that's not that's cool to see what it can do. And the other day I saw somebody saying a video that they made and they posted it and even promoted it on, on, on Facebook saying that, 
you know, we asked this question to ChatGPT to see what it comes up with in terms of financial advice for a client. It was a very generic question. No information provided, no nothing, just a simple question. And that's exactly what they got back, a generic answer. And then they went on about, you know, like, uh, yeah, but this is why your financial advisor got to spend. And I mean, I'm all with it. Talk to your financial advisor. That's absolutely what, what everybody should be doing. But also understand that the way you talk to, to AI uh, it has a direct bearing on the outcome that you get from that. So we've been using this now since it came out in November, the previous year, when it was it 2022? Uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, I use it a lot in this space. Uh, so I'm going to share with you the best things that I've learned of how to talk to AI. Uh, and if you sort of look at this, uh, it doesn't matter which system it is, whether it's ChatGPT or it's uh, Anthropic Slide or it's Gemini or Perplexity or any of these systems, it does not matter because it's in the skill of talking to it. It doesn't matter which system it is. So um, we want to teach uh, you that. And this is going to be available only for our propulsion members. So if you're not a member, go check it out. The link is also down below. And uh, otherwise, uh, for the members, uh, we've already put it on the platform. So you can go and book for that. It's completely included in your membership. So yeah, looking forward to that session. Anyway, so there you got it. Propulsion Tech, important. Join us for the book launch and uh, become a member if you're not yet. Righty, with that, let's get into today's main topic. Right. So as I said, when I started off today's episode is that, you know, we often feel oh, life is hard. Things are difficult. It's really tough. Uh, and it feels like things are becoming tougher and tougher. And then for people who are in business, they will definitely tell you that business is even harder. Uh, it's definitely not something that's, that's easy. And it does become easy at some point when everything is in place. But in that early journey, when we're building businesses and when we sort of get to those specific stages where things now suddenly you know, it's, it's either just flatlined and, and we've got to do something else to go to the next level, or even we, we we think like this is where we are. We just want to maintain. There's so many sort of different phases in a business that every time we will be faced with challenges and things that we haven't done before and things that we just don't know actually how to, how to approach them. But all of this uh, has really brought, uh, you know, a lot of insights, I think, over the years because I've been doing this for, for a very long time. You know, some people think I only started back in 2020. Uh, because the only time that they learned that we even existed was when we started the show. And it's not really the truth. Uh, I've been around for a long time. I've been doing my own thing for a very, very long time. And uh, it was a long, hard journey because of certain things I did not do. And those are the things that really stand out for me. Because once you start doing them, everything changes. And then you get to a point where you go, oh, okay. I should have done this a long time ago. Have you ever said that in your business? I should have done this a long time ago. Uh, well, there were quite a few of those for me. And, and this is also not just about how fantastically successful uh, the outcomes were, because trust me, uh, most of them were not. This is about, you know, how do you take a situation and look for, actively look for what's the lesson in this? Actively look for how can I use this to learn from? How can I use this to be better next time? You know, what did we take away from this? Doesn't matter how bad or how good the thing is that happened, because often we won't focus on the things that are good, right? We only go and focus on the things that are bad. And like, what was that? Why did this happen? What did we not do? But when things go well, we don't go and sit and say, well, what are we doing that's actually causing this to go well? So those are some of the things that I just want to sort of start off with to say, just have that as a background and a context of where this is coming from. I've got about 50 of these lessons that I've written down. I'm going to share seven with you. Uh, I think last season I shared seven or five others with you as well. So today, these are seven different ones that I want to share with you, uh, just sort of uh, from, from that point. Now, there was a period of time in my life where I think people thought that, you know, it's like, oh, he's, he's, he's jumping around. He's moving from here and then he's there. He doesn't know what he wants to do. Or, or even things like, you know, you can't depend on him because he's only going to be here for two years and then he's going to move on. And there's something that those people don't understand usually, and often for us that finds ourselves in that place, it's very difficult to, to also say, well, you know, why am I doing this? Why is this happening? And there's something inside of you that you simply can't explain to people, and sometimes you can't even explain it to yourself. But the one thing that I've come to realize is that when you are sort of jumping from one place to another, it's not because you're not dependable. 
well, that people can't depend on you. It's not because, uh, you know, of anything other than you're still searching. So for me here, the big thing is that, you know, if you don't know, whether it's you don't know what you want to do, you don't know what clients you want to work with, you don't know if you want to be a financial advisor, if you don't know whatever it is that you do, whatever your role is at the moment, if you just feel like, yeah, this is fine, but it's not really the thing, and there's something inside you that's really driving you towards something specific, you know, the job is to go and find out. Because this is what happened, right? So back in, um, I mean, there's quite a few things. So so I was at, uh, at at one of the insurance companies for a very long time, from 2004 to 2012. I then left. I was nine months at the next place. And then I went into uh, building a practice with somebody else. And six months into that, I was just like, I, I don't even get up in the morning uh, in bed. You know, 10 o'clock in the morning, I would still be in bed. I'm not doing anything. And that's not me. For those of you who, who do really do know me, that's definitely not me. And I realized at some point, like something's not right as well. So there's there's all these telltale signs. Then my wife also came and said, like, yeah, that this isn't you. Like, what's going on? And I know what you need. You need a life coach. Now, back then, I don't even think in 2014, life coaching was a big thing, uh, but it was becoming something. And then I landed up with someone that was everything but a life coach. <clears throat> I think she was more of a psychologist. Anyway, worked through some stuff. And then the one big thing that I realized during those 10 sessions was that I don't know what I want. I just know that the thing I'm doing now is not the thing. But I don't know what the thing is. <laughs> that makes it very difficult. And this was the big one, yeah. Like, if you don't know, then the job is to find out. That becomes the job. It's the same like when you're unemployed. When you don't have a job, the job is to find a job. That becomes the job, right? So. The same thing with this, and this applies to anything, not just what it is that you want to do in life and you know what you want to pursue and all of that. Anything in life, if you don't know, the job is to find out. So the big thing is to just try, just do the next thing, fail, be happy with that, be okay with it to say, you know what, I've been here now for two years. I'm sorry, this is not for me. Because ultimately, it is about your happiness. It is about the things that's driving you. It's about the things that get you out of bed in the morning. And that year or two years or three years or five years or 20 years, if you've been around, you've been feeling like this for 20 years, but you think you can't move, so you've got to stay. You've learned a lot during that period of time. So it's never time lost. And people did get value from you being there. So, so nobody can really complain. But this is important. So if you don't know, the job is to find out. So that's that's sort of number number one. So in 2015, when I sort of started realizing that, you know, like maybe this training thing is a thing that I want to do and that it really speaks to me, it really excites me. Uh, and it took somebody else to to point this out to me, which was an incredible thing because I didn't get it the first time when he said it to me. And then only like three months later when he said it again, that it really uh, struck me what he was saying. And the way that I got started, well, that's a whole story for another day, but it's 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 incredible. And to sort of then realize like this is the thing that I want to do. So in 2015, I started figuring that out. 2016, I sold my practice and then I went full into this. But it was really, really hard uh, to get going with this. The, the, the one thing I learned here is that it doesn't matter what you know, and being able to do the job is completely something different from building a business. Like being able to do the job, you can be the best at what you do in the world, but if you don't know how to build a business, uh, you know, it's sort of a, a little bit difficult. But anyway, so so what happened year after year after year, uh, when it comes to October or so, like the cash flow just dried up. There was nothing, 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 nothing. Because why? Well, everybody stops training in October and they sort of push for the end of the year. And it's like, we got to get to the next level and we've got to make targets and we don't worry about training anymore. It's now year in functions and targets. That's it. So I found myself in this, and then what happens inevitably is that I it, it really got me to do nothing. I was so like I didn't know what to do, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. I had no clue what to do, so I did nothing. And also, I was so stressed about it because it uh, I sort of assigned a specific meaning to it, and because I assigned a specific meaning to it, it made me like feel like I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if I'm meant to do this. I don't like you question all of these things, and. Uh, Sort of what then happened was I, uh, when it was 2018, again in October, it was exactly the same story. And I just decided, well, actually 2017, so, so 2018. Um, so actually then I decided like next year, this is not going to be the case. 
So there are certain things that I need to do. And this is the big thing. It's not about knowing what to do. It's not about having a list of things that you want to do. It's about actually doing them. So it's about taking action. It's the uh, Acta Non Verba is a book that uh, it's a Latin expression for um, action, not words. But Acta Non Verba is a book also that um, Eric wrote. Oh, I can't remember Eric's name now. Um, but anyway, so, so, so Eric wrote this book uh, and it was actually just made up of his emails that he was sending to his email list every single day. The South African guy is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, I got to see him speak at SME Africa uh, around about in 2018 somewhere. And something just sort of struck a chord with me. It's not about knowing these things. It's not about saying, uh, let's see if luck is in my favor this time. It was about taking the actions. It was about making the call, doing what's necessary. So making the call, asking for help. Because often, like, we don't ask for help, right? So I'm not just bundling a lot of things into one year. Sometimes it might mean that maybe you got to take on a second job, you know, or temporary job or something. But do what is necessary to get you through this and to get you to the next level. And plan in advance. That's that's the big important thing. Because I was so busy with the day-to-day -day things like all of we are. And then before you know it, it was October and I'm screwed. Okay, so now what's next? So the second one I want to share with you is act on on verbal. It's action over words, and it for me is do what is necessary. Uh, don't don't yeah, no excuses, right? So we've got to do what needs to be done. And things changed um, for 2019 because I did some things differently, and then uh, beyond that, obviously after we did some other stuff, uh, a lot of things. Because because there's another lesson in there that I'll share with you in a moment. Also back in 2016, now you must you must think about this, that things are tough, cash flow is erratic, it's up and down, up and down, then there's money, then there's no money, because what typically happens when you have a small business, you look for clients, you find clients, then you do the work, then you're not looking for clients, and then you're done with the work, and then you say, oh crap, I don't have clients, and then I go look for clients, like it's this start, stop, start, stop, start, stop all the time, and you move almost from, from one, uh, how can I put this, like, you move from a one high to a low and from a low back to a high. But it's these these values of things that are like, just as you think. Uh, and then the other problem that I had was like, oh, when there was money in the bank, I would actually relax because I I deserve to, to relax a little bit, right? And then you sort of don't do the things that you were doing when you weren't at the top. And then it's it was a, it was a really bad snowball effect. Anyway, so in 2016, I'm in Bloemfontein, and uh, I'm driving. I was doing training there, uh, doing people that were going through the NQF5, I think. Um, and uh, we were doing some training there. And I got this call um, from, from my wife. And uh, we had this massive sort of thing on the phone because, like, when am I going to get a job? And when is this? And she's tired of this and that. And, uh, and there was something else that triggered that. It's not like, um, you know, she didn't um, support me or anything like that. There's something else that happened that caused her to react like that because she always has to answer questions for other people and, and things like that. So I totally got it. But in that very moment, I just decided I don't need anyone. I will prove to everybody what can be done. And that was a big thing for me because, you know, often so many people have told me that your know, business is difficult. You know, you're not going to be able to do this. Um, there's all these reasons because people are inherently risk averse, right? So they don't want to take on risk. They can't see it working. So unless they are paid a salary, they're really not comfortable. And I saw this in COVID as well. I had a few friends who lost their jobs or at least their jobs were at risk of losing or they reduced their salaries and things like that. But they would just sit there, you know, or people who did lose their job was just like, now I've got to find another job. Okay, so but there's so many other things you can do. So at the end of the day, it's about, you know, you've got to listen, not listen rather to other people. You've got to listen to the right people. And even if that person is just you, because in that moment in 2016, I was like, screw this. Um, I don't need anybody to, to, to believe in me. I'm going to do this because I know where this is going. I know why I'm doing this because this is finally something that connected with me. Um, and I will make this work. And at some point, somebody is going to go like, oh, now I see it. And inevitably that happened. It took a long time, but, but we got there. Um, but that's not the moral of the story. The, the big moral of the story here is that even when family, friends, loved ones, it doesn't matter. When they tell you, like, no, no, just go do this because this is not working. Just go do that because this is not working. 
if you can see where things are going, because that's often the thing, like you and I can see where things are going that nobody else can see it. And often we have more patience than they do because all they see is what you don't have and what you're not achieving. But you've got to think long-term. You've got to think about where are you headed because it's these little things we do every single day that moves us closer and closer and closer until it's just sort of a waterfall where things just start happening. So that's the big thing, right? So listen to the right people, even if that person is just you. Now, there's a thing that I want to end off today with, not now, but when I get to the end, that's also going to talk to that because there is something that we need to look out for uh, in that. It's not as simple as that. So you really need, we all need that one person. How many of you have said, you know, just because that person believed in me, that's what got me to take action because that person believed in me. And it usually was a good manager or it was a friend or a loved one or somebody who said, you can do this. I believe in you. And because of that, you did that. But I still believe that often that one person could just be you as well. So, so don't think about all of this other noise uh, as well, but you've got to do the things that needs to be done, right? So <laughs> the, the, the other thing that is quite, quite interesting, um, I don't know if people think I've got discipline. <laughs> I absolutely don't. Um, on my strengths finder, discipline is number 32 of 34 or 31 of 34. Um, so it's way at the bottom. So one of the things that I really realized is that, and this is something that came directly from doing my Clifton Strengths uh, and working with you on West Eisen and that, that the one thing that I learned was that um, just because there's something, because everybody you'll see, Tom Bilyeu and people like that talk about discipline, discipline, discipline. That's what gets you to be healthy. That's what gets you to build a business. That's what gets you to be wealthy is the discipline. But sometimes for some of us, discipline is not a natural thing. Now, the one big thing that I learned was that I could use other strengths in order to, to hack myself into being, or at least to, to seem disciplined. So I am very strategic. I am futuristic, ideation, those kinds of things, responsibilities, some of my top five. And that has caused me to say, well, if I can do, what could I do from that point of view that would just take away the fact that I don't need to be disciplined because I can automate some of this stuff or I could give it to somebody else to do or we could do other stuff to make sure that this happens. And that, that was the big lesson for me is that you don't need to be able to do everything. You don't need to be great at everything. But the things that you are really good at, use that to hack the bad habits or the weaknesses. You know, for too long, We've been in a game where uh, I remember back when when I was a consultant and also even when I was a manager, you would ask people like, you know, what are your weaknesses? And then that's what we need to develop. No nonsense. Like what are the things that you're really good at? Because that's the stuff you want to spend a lot of time on. You love spending time on it. You want to get as great as you can. And for your call it weaknesses or development areas, as we used to call them, just either get somebody else who can do that, who's better at that, for whom it's a strength. That's what we should be doing. So think about your business. There are a lot of stuff that you don't want to do, but you do it because they have to get done. But find somebody else who really loves that stuff. There's people who love compliance and there's people who love operations and there's people who love all of these things. It is their world. Your world is probably seeing clients. So go focus on that. Don't focus on these other things. And don't let money be the thing that stands in your way because it's an investment into, into that. Because if you're not spending time there, you're spending time on things you love and you're definitely going to make uh, more money because of that. And and on that note, um, so, so just so you know, so 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 that lesson was use your strengths to uh, hack your bad habits and weaknesses. But on that note, the biggest thing that I probably learned, there's something I talk about a lot in the seven habits uh, to build a legendary practice. The very first thing that you and I should do, doesn't matter what role you're in. So whether you're in admin, or whether you're financial advisor or planner, or whether you're a sales manager, doesn't matter what it is you do, You've got to go and identify in your role, what are the three top things that you've got to be doing every single day that will generate revenue? So think about this, right? There's loads of things. So if you're a financial advisor, there's, oh, I need to write a newsletter for my clients because that might result in revenue. I've got to issue the invoices for the work that I've done or that I'm about to do. So that's revenue generating. I've got to make that video. I've got to do that social media post. I've got to do all these things. And absolutely, yes but are they your responsibility? And is it the thing that you should be doing in your role? For me, it's, if I should think about if I'm a financial advisor, what are the things that generate revenue? Well, seeing clients is the very first thing. Building a network 
or networking. That's the second thing. So that's what I should be doing every single day and then decide, okay, what are the other things that I do? So unless I've done those things, I shouldn't be doing the other things. So it's just a matter of bringing focus as well. Um, you know, for me in, in our business, it's, it is literally about seeing people doing sessions and creating content because we need all three of those in order to generate revenue. And even the content is, is, is maybe debatable, could outsource that to somebody else and I could still deliver that. Uh, but be this may, what are the three things that you need to be focusing on every single day that generates revenue directly, not indirectly, directly? So that that is a big one for me um, as well. I don't know how often you find yourself in a situation where you find yourself where I know exactly what the end outcome is that I'm looking for. I can see it. This is how it's going to be. If this works, this is exactly what's going to be. But hell, I don't know how, how I'm going to do it. I have no idea what the steps are, you know, because everybody says starts with the end in mind and then work backwards. So it's almost like, okay, so I, this is the end outcome. Before that, I had to do this, and then I had to do this, and then I had to do this, and then I had to do this until you get to the beginning, and then you just start doing the stuff. Now, that sounds fantastic when you're doing uh, some kind of a course. But in reality, we often don't know. We might know the big things, but even within the big things, we don't know the exact steps that we need to do. Now, because we don't know the exact steps, it often leads to inaction. It often means that we don't do anything because we first have to figure out every single thing that we've done. And I don't believe that that's really useful. There were many, many cases that I can give you examples of where I just did something. You just take that first step. And then the next step happens and the next step will, will, will show it. And then sort of I've done this quite a few times. And then I also read this in, I think it was the Entrepreneur Revolution by Daniel Priestley, where he was actually saying the exact same thing. Just make that first call. Just take that first step. Just have that one meeting. Just do this, do this. And then the next thing will reveal itself. Even if you don't know how you are going to do this, just do something. I think is often the better thing because that's something more than not will lead to the next thing and it will just reveal itself as you go. So, you know, sometimes I know that we really love having certainty and that we know, we want to know that we're going to get this outcome. But I also don't believe that that's how life and business works. You know, there's too many things. The only things we can own are the decisions we make. So why did I make this decision today? The outcome, I have no control over. The decision I do. And if the outcome is different from the one that I hoped for, doesn't mean that I made the wrong decision. No, because that decision I made was actually done with the information at hand and the way that I viewed the world at that time. So it's not a problem. It is what it is. It's fine. So we shouldn't get all onto like, oh, I didn't get what I want, so I made the wrong decision. No, there was nothing wrong with your decision. Things changed after you made the decision, which made the outcome. Maybe there were information that wasn't available at the time. Maybe some of the things changed after that. There are many things that you can't control. It's almost like when you do a plan for a client today, you know, you know tomorrow it's wrong, right? So that's why we review it every year to sort of adjust and do things like that. So that's important. Um, just take that first step. Um, it will be okay. And uh, often that's exactly what happened with the show. I had no idea what to do. I think some people had a massive... 20 point plan for how they're going to get through COVID. I had no freaking idea. No idea. All I did was see a guy go live on YouTube every day. I said, oh, I can do that. I did it. And uh, I mean, there was a lot of grace and a lot of um, luck. I think also the timing was right and things like that. If I were to do that when there wasn't COVID, probably nobody would be watching still. So there's a lot of things that came together, but there was no, no foresight or insight or like the only inspiration I had was not to go insane. So that's why we did this show. But this is the thing that changed everything else in our business and in my life. So it's really incredible uh, what something like that can do. And that's the most incredible. When you look back and you go like, this is the one thing I should have done a long time ago, but I don't think the time was right a long time ago. So everything will unfold the way that it has to. Then, you know, one of the things that I see a lot of people do, and I was also one of those where we, we think that this is, Let's say this is the status quo, but we want it to be different. So we want to change it and we've got a different view of the world. And we say, like, this is what it should be, you know, one case in point, maybe fees. So there's this debate between commission and fees. And some people say, no, you know, commission, just there's a conflict of interest, can't do that. There's no relationship between the product and the advice. And 
like all of these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, advice don't always lead to this, but then you don't get paid. Like none of these things make sense. And even if you do get paid, how much you get paid doesn't make, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of conversation going on. But then we have like people who are on, on the extreme that will go like fees is the only way to go. There's other people say, I can't build a business unless there's commission. And then you've got all the different permutations um, in between. But the biggest thing that I've learned, uh, you know, is that, or the one danger that we have is that we get so romantic about an idea. And there's a difference between being passionate about an idea and believing in an idea and just being romantic about it. So if you're romantic about it, you know, they say love is blind. So you really, you talk so much about it and it can't be any other way. And this is what I believe in. And it's fine. You must have a philosophy and you must stand for something. But when you realize that this thing is not going to work, and I'm not saying that fees, I'm just saying whatever that thing is, if that doesn't work, then you must be very careful that you don't not let go because you've now spoken yourself almost into a corner with everything that you've said about how, how, how bad this other thing is and this is the way that it should be. So that will leave you in a position where now you feel like you, you, you can't stop because you've now set these things out into the world. But in fact, that's exactly what you should be doing. And to rather go from a point that, look, I've learned this throughout this process, I still believe that this is the way where we need to get but we'll get there in time, but it's not going to happen today. So don't be romantic about ideas because if you're romantic about an idea, it will often cause you to hold on to an idea that's bad for you. And uh, holding on to an idea that, um, you know, it's, it's causing you, it's holding you back. It means that you're not going forward. Remember, in the end, everything is about doing the right thing for the right reason with the right intent. That's it. And if you can tick those three boxes, everything else will be fine. So we shouldn't overthink it and, and all of that. So again, you know, be confident about your idea. Be passionate about your idea, but don't romanticize that um, because you might not see the wood for the trees. So those are the lessons I wanted to share with you. I'm keen to look at the comments just now. So thank you very much. Alrighty, so let's see some of the, the comments here. Um, let's see. Let me just go. Uh, thank you very much, Neil. Neil says very real words. Um, Terence says yes about the version and the why, or the vision and the why. Oh, uh, Tanya is saying, uh, so thanks for sharing so much in terms of your personal life journey. Uh, one thing I realized as outsiders, we often don't know what people go through we just see the success, but never the rest of the journey. Also, as you say, see the hard work and the struggles. Yeah, we, you know, and it is just like that. And also people think it happens overnight, right? <laughs> it's a long journey uh, that we go through. And, and all of us, like it's not, no one's special in that regard. We all have a story. That's the amazing thing that I really uh, always think about. Uh, Neil says, Ben Hardy's book, Who Not How, uh, Who Not How is excellent. Um, absolutely. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, Liana says, be open-minded and not miss opportunities. And uh, fantastic. Um, Quibus ends off here with saying profound sessions today. Yes, I think all the sessions really hit home. So thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate uh, your being here. Thank you for joining us live. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, do, please do subscribe and uh, like this video, share it with others, help us get the word out. But on that, have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you back next week. Same time, same place. And uh, be blessed. Stay safe and prosper. I forgot my own words now. <laughs> anyway, have a fantastic weekend. Love you lots. Bye-bye.